Hello. Hello to everyone and thank you for coming to this session. <clears throat> we are going to discuss briefly today what we now know and what the potential is for the vaccination against HPV for the prevention of cancer. In slide number four, you'll see my potential conflict of interest, and I would like to declare that this presentation has been independently prepared by myself and that I have the entire responsibility of the preparation. And slide number five indicates to you again that you might ask questions in between, and Dr. Pecatori will gently qualify and organize your questions and interrupt me if this is the case. <coughs> Now, slide number six uh, shows you the agenda of what I would like to cover today. And the first one is, is HPV vaccine adequate? Why do we have to do that? And what are the reasons why we want to vaccinate? And the first of the reasons is that first time in history of oncology, HPV has been declared as a necessary cause of cervical cancer. Slide number seven shows the paper that reported that, in fact, in a very large series of cases of invasive cancer worldwide, HPV DNA could be recovered in 99% of the cases. That study and many other studies that follow confirm that the presence of HPV DNA, the previous presence of the infection, was a necessary cause, and therefore, in the absence of infection, there wouldn't be disease. And the consequence of that is that if you are able to prevent the infection, you will effectively eliminate cervical cancer. The second of the reasons that we want to vaccinate is shown in slide number eight, and it refers to the natural history of the infection and the disease. The, the first part of the graph shows a very, a very high level of HPV infections in the early age groups, say girls 15 to 20, they have up to 30, 40, or even 50% prevalence of the infection. And then one or two decades later, those infections generate precancerous lesions. And yet again, 10 years later, 15 years later, in the 40s and 50s, the occurrence of invasive cervical cancer. Because we know that those infections precede the disease by at least two to three decades, we have an extraordinary important window of opportunity to immunize girls, particularly in the very young age groups, 9 to 15, which are indicated in red. And more recently, we've discovered that, in fact, the benefit of vaccination can expand to elderly women, as indicated by the red bar at the bottom of the graph. So we want to vaccinate because we can prevent the cause of the major cancer. Next slide, number nine, it shows that indeed those viruses are extremely potent carcinogens. And they are not only the cause of all cervical cancer cases worldwide, but they are also significantly involved in the etiology of a number of other cancers in the anogenital tract. And one of the more recent findings is that also cancers of the oropharynx are induced by the same HPV types, particularly HPV-16, that is a mucosotropic uh, HPV type that can infect both the genital and the oral cavity, all of those linked by the epidemiological model of the transmission of a sexually transmitted infection. Now, having established that we want to vaccinate and that we have good reasons to vaccinate, Slide number 10 moves us into the concept of vaccine composition. So we want to know if the vaccines need to include theoretically all the HPV types involved in carcinogenesis, and how are the currently available vaccines doing to that respect. And it is clear that 16 and 18 are the two HPV types that more often are found in cancer. But those vaccines have also provided some interesting findings, which is called cross-protection. That indeed indicates that if you vaccinate against 16 and 18, you might spill over and indeed have an impact in the prevention of other HPV types. And we'll speak a little bit about that. And finally, there is very nearby in the future 
a novel vaccine that will include seven high-risk HPV types, <clears throat> namely 16 and 18, but also 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. And those vaccines might indeed have the potential to even increase the ability of our vaccines to prevent infection and cancer. <clears throat> so slide number 11 shows you in terms of relative contributions and uh, proportions in the right hand side of the slide of the viruses <clears throat> that are linked to cervical cancer. If you look at the global uh, part of the graph, it indicates that HPV 16 and 18 account for about 70%, 70.8% of the cases of cervical cancer. Adding 31 moves the 70 to 74.5, and if you add 33 and 45, you are up to 84% of the cancers altogether. If you look at the bottom part of the graph, for the adenocarcinomas, the proportions increase by a factor of 10%. So the 70% attributable to 16 and 18 becomes 82% and so on and so forth. These proportions are the ones that we are currently using to estimate what would be the impact of the reduction of disease in a fully vaccinated cohort of girls. <clears throat> That study is based on over 10,000 invasive cervical cancer cases examined in our laboratories from 32 countries in the world. So the next question is, okay, if we are now having a vaccine that would prevent eventually between 70 and 85% of the cases of cervical cancer, is that consistent throughout the world? Is it something that can be applied and therefore our vaccine should work exactly in the same way anywhere in the world. So graph number 12 shows for these for the very the same study by Euro, by regions in the world and that's Europe, Asia, Africa, North America, Latin America and Oceania. Again, remember that this is a study including over 10,000 cases. The first part of the color bar, which is in the, in the brown color, it indicates the contribution of 16 and 18 to cervical cancer. And we are down to the 70% that I was mentioning before. <clears throat> if we add in the red part of the graph, the cases that are due to types that are included in the novel vaccine and that are partially included in the cross protection offered by the current vaccines, you would add globally another 19%, leaving 10% of the cases that might not be covered by the vaccines, either the current vaccines or the vaccines to arrive very soon. But the interesting thing in this graph is that, is that those proportions are extremely consistent worldwide. And therefore, we do have good vaccines that cover a significant fraction of the disease and that are equally good anywhere in the world. Graph number 13 <clears throat> expands the same concept to the rest of the cancers that are due to human papillomavirus. HPV 16 being the most aggressive of them is also the more predominant in any other of the epithelials and mucosa that are more resistant to HPV carcinogenesis and therefore the expected proportion due to the times that are included in the non-avalent vaccine eventually will be also protected with the cross-protection effect of the current vaccines ranges from 83% in anal cancer to 60% in cancer of the vagina, 30 to 40% in cancer of the vulva and the penis, and perhaps 25% in cancer of the oropharynx. At this stage in slide number 14, I would invite if there are any questions from either Dr. Pedro Pecatori or from the audience. Uh, yes, Xavier, thank you very much for this first part of your presentation, which was uh, very clear. I actually have a question about uh, the prevalence of the different uh, HPV types uh, 
around the world. As you said, uh, it's quite consistent, actually, and uh, the protection, which uh, may be due to the non-avalent vaccination, uh, it's very high, up to 90 percent, which is a very good news. But uh, why are still some differences uh, about the different part of the world? Uh, for example, in Africa, there is a 13 percent uh, of uh, other HPV types uh, which are not the one covered by the non-avalent vaccination. Are there some other causes of this difference? Uh, yeah, we do not really know. Uh, what we have observed in various studies, although the, the amount of information we have from Africa is significantly lower than from Europe or other parts of the world, but what we have observed is that the relative contribution of even HPV-16, which is dominant, is smaller than the one that we observe in, uh, in Europe or in the United States. The implication is that in those populations, the less aggressive HPV types often make it all the way up to invasive cervical cancer. And uh, one, of one of the explanations for that is that perhaps those populations, they do have a lower quality of the immune response against aggressions, perhaps because their immune system is already overloaded by malaria infections, malnutrition or HIV infections, and therefore even, even relatively modestly aggressive HPV types indeed end up generating invasive cervical cancer. Yeah, that's very interesting and really calls for a global strategy of intervention, which is not just HPV, but, but maybe also related to other non-transmissible non -transmittable disease or transmittable disease. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Very much. Go ahead, please, uh, Xavier, with your presentation. Okay, so the, the third part of my talk in slide number 15 refers to the phase three vaccination trials which indeed have been completed, they have been largely published, and I understand that the majority of our audience is aware of the basic results of those trials. Slide number 16 tries to focus on, tries to understand how those vaccines work. And the answer is that we believe that the major component of the protection is indeed the generation of antibodies that circulate in the blood, and that they exudate and trasudate to the cervical vaginal fluid. What you have here in your slide is a, a, a cartoon on the way we understand things happen. The virus arrives and needs to infect the basal layer of the cell of the epithelium in the cervix and needs to have like a small crack and needs to have a, a disruption of the epithelium. So it can reach the basal layer. And that is something that often occurs during sexual intercourse. So these are minute, really minute traps. They are not wounds. They are just small fissures in the epithelium. Then the virus enters the basal layer cell and then uses the machinery of the, of the differentiation process to actually replicate and eventually gets desquamated. But it gets desquamated along with the natural squamation that is occurring in the cervix of a normal woman. The interesting component of that cartoon <clears throat> is that the immune system does not see that process ongoing. The virus grows, reproduces, and gets uh, spread without inducing necrosis of the cell, without in inducing inflammatory signs, without creating any alarm signal and therefore, the immune response is very weak or inexistent. Now, in slide 17, we, we begin to understand how this process happens. The first, the first process when the virus arrives to the basal layer is to attach to a receptor. And the attachment to a receptor just induces small conformational changes. And those changes expose the L2 region of the surface of the virus. And once that modification of the external surface of the virus has occurred, then the virus can attach to the receptor in the cell, which is in the right-hand side of your slide, and enter the cell. Once the virus is within the cell, the antibodies cannot reach 
and there is no effect and no therapeutic effect of those vaccines because the antibodies cannot reach a virus that is hiding inside the cell. <clears throat> now, if the, if the person is vaccinated and there is a high level of antibodies, which is the second line in the cartoon, those antibodies, they attach to the surface of the virus and avoid and prevent the attachment to the receptor in the basal, in the basal membrane. Because of that, then the virus can be destroyed by lymphocytes or any other of the, of the natural defense cells. Even if the vaccine has induced very low levels of antibodies, and this is one of the most recent discoveries, they cannot prevent the attachment to the basal membrane, but the conformational changes are not sufficient to allow the virus to enter the cell. And one of the conclusions of those observations is that indeed, even very low levels of antibodies circulating in the blood and in the cervical vaginal mucus are able to protect the woman against cervical cancer. The impact of those observations is still to be fully deployed, <clears throat> but we are thinking that perhaps that would allow in the future to use only two doses of vaccine or even only one dose of vaccine because even small levels of antibodies are able to induce the protection. So slide number 18 shows what will happen if a woman is vaccinated, the fluid, the cervical vaginal fluid is loaded with antibodies, an HPV virus arriving will be surrounded and the receptors in the surface will be blocked and therefore infection will not occur in the first instance. That is also uh, an interesting observation that might indeed explain that even if a woman is infected and is shedding HPV types, if the woman is vaccinated, at the exit of those viruses to, to go into infecting a new partner, those viruses will go already loaded with antibodies. And there are a few observations, very difficult clinical observations, indicate that perhaps vaccinated women that are HPV positive, for, for example, women with a CIN2 or CIN3 that receives the vaccine, might not resolve the infection or the lesion because of the vaccine, but perhaps might uh, reduce the probability of infection of their partners. So if we move into slide number 19, we enter what are the results of the trials. And I'll, I'll try to be uh, uh, relatively quick on those because the majority of those uh, results are probably known to you. There are two vaccines. The names are Gardasil and Cervix. Gardasil includes 16 and 18, as well as 6 and 11. And Cervix uh, is a bivalent vaccine that includes 16 and 18. Now, the strong point of Gardasil is that it also includes 6 and 11. 6 and 11 are not carcinogenic viruses, but they are the cause of all uh, genital warts, as well as respiratory papillomatosis of the infants. The strong point of Cervix is that they use a very potent adjuvant called ASO4 that induces very high titers of uh, antibodies. And in a comparative trial, those antibody titers induced by Cervix were significantly higher both for 16 and 18 to the ones induced by Gardasil. Vaccines are safe and we now have information that goes from the trials to the uh, vigilance of uh, phase four trials in vaccinated cohorts in the real population. And so far, there hasn't been any alarm sign that precludes the recommendation and the use of the vaccine. Slide number 20 deals with the immune response. And those vaccines, they are extraordinarily good. 100% of the vaccinated individuals develop antibody titers at a very high level. There is a good correlation between the levels in the blood and the levels in the cervical vaginal fluid, showing that indeed the, uh, the antibodies reach the organ site in which the primary infections occur. And those trials have been followed uh, nowadays up to nine years and we can confirm that the 
antibody titers and therefore the expected protection will last for at least that long. It's also an interesting observation that if a woman is vaccinated after a certain period of time, perhaps one or two years, the antibody titers fall to a standard plateau and that is shown in slide 21. And uh, here you can see the red line. If at the, at the five-year interval after vaccination, the woman receives another dose of the vaccine, you induce an antibody titer which is much faster and much higher even than the one that we observed in the initial vaccination schedule. That indicates that there is immune memory and therefore one can anticipate that the vaccine will be really long lasting and that there won't be necessary a booster dose uh, uh, along the line. Now slide number 22 uh, starts to show the efficacy and here you have in the left hand side the efficacy against CIN2, against CIN3, against VIN, against genital warts in women, genital warts in men, and all of those have been proven at an extremely high level. Those vaccines confer protection against HPV 16 and 18 induced lesions at a level between 95 and 99 percent. Extraordinarily potent vaccines that translate into a protection against close to 70 percent of cervical cancer and 70 percent is the fraction that I showed you before was due to those two times. Now slide number 23 expands a little bit on the protection and indicates that uh, both vaccines have, have shown protection against HPV 31 for which there aren't uh, antigens in the preparation and cervix in addition has antibody teeters and protection against HPV 33 and 45. So if you, if you generate an analysis of CIN2 cases independent of HPV type, which is the second line in my table, that is to say, if I don't care about HPV type, I have my cohort, I vaccinate them all, how much disease will I prevent? And that ranges from 43% for Gardasil to 70% uh, on cervix due to the uh, at least the short-term impact of cross-protection. The results of the, the final results of the cervix trial indicates that the protection against CIN3, which is the closest, the closest uh, surrogate from cervical cancer, can be as high as 93%. An extraordinary result. Then the the next uh, that, that is when we vaccinate HPV naive populations and most of that is the, the basis of the indication which focus on uh, a primary target population in young adolescents and girls. Now <clears throat> another interesting observation that is uh, shown in slide number 24 is that if you vaccinate women up to the age of 26, which is the majority of the trial. These large trials have been conducted in, in women 15 to 26. In many instances, that woman has already been infected before, and she's either uh, HPV DNA positive or has already a low seal lesion. Now, what happens if you vaccinate women that have already been infected or that are infected at the time when you vaccinate? And the two lines in the graph shows that in the first 24 months, there's, there's equal incidence of CIN2 or CIN3 in the vaccinated and the placebo group. But after two years, the two lines begin to separate apart and they continue to separate the more you do a longer follow-up. And this is because the cases to be because they were already there at the time of vaccination or the persistent infection was there at the time of vaccination, they will develop in the first two years of observation. Once those cases have been exhausted, then the preventive potential of those vaccines fully expressed and there's clear differences between the woman that received the vaccine and the woman that are not vaccinated. So slide number 25, shows uh, some other interesting results and the most important one is the first line. It shows that adult women 26 to 45 or more that entered 
uh, adult women tryouts, they were extremely well protected, provided that they were HPV DNA negative at entry. And that forms the basis for the new thoughts at this stage, which is that we can much better use the, the, the HPV vaccines. We can, we can get the full potential of those, uh, of those vaccines if we expand our indication to women that might benefit because they are in the, in the let's say, in the 45 age range limit, but they are not HPV DNA infected at the time of vaccination. Slide number 26 is a little bit more speculative, but answers the question, what would happen with the other cancers that are related to HPV-16 infections? And we begin to have some indication for renal cancer, and those are largely studies on male homosexuals. There's a proven efficacy of Gardasil in the prevention of genital warts and the prevention of anal intraepithelial neoplasia, eventually anal cancer. And we do have some indications that cervix reduced dramatically the prevalence of HPV DNA in the oral cavity of vaccinated girls in the cohort of Guanacaste. So the concept here is that those vaccines might not only be extraordinarily efficient in preventing cervical cancer, but they will also have some impact and a significant impact in the reduction of other cancers for which today we do not have any preventive opportunity. So slide number 27 shows some other ongoing research issues that are of interest. The first one is that uh, we now have strong suspicion that the two-dose regimes uh, might be sufficient and that would great, greatly simplify our protocols and therefore the cost of the programs in the majority of the countries in the world. <clears throat> There are other regimes being investigated, for example, using the vaccine rather than having 0, 1, and 6 months, using at 0, 6, and 60, that is to say, leaving the booster dose or the third dose at, at five years from the initial dose. And some ongoing results from the Quebec indicate that indeed those girls that receive two doses at 0 and 6 they retain a sufficiently high number of uh, titer of antibodies so that they might not need a third dose uh, after five years. <clears throat> I think that I would now invite Dr. Pecatori to do another break here at slide number 28 if there are any questions in relation to those trials. Uh, yes, Xavier, there are a number of questions from the floor and uh, some are related to the biology of uh, HPV. You mentioned that uh, the main routes of uh, transmission of HPV are uh, uh, sexual, so it's, uh, HPV may be considered as a sexually transmitted disease. I just want you to confirm this. Is that true for the high-risk types? Yes, <clears throat> I think that we have to <clears throat> consider that this is the predominant mode of transmission. <clears throat> okay, there is, there is another uh, interesting question, it's more a philosophical question because uh, it comes from uh, Sandy and uh, Sandy asks uh, why to invest uh, in uh, treating uh, uh, cervical cancer uh, if we will have uh, such an effective vaccination? I may <clears throat> answer as a clinical oncologist, I think that we still see uh, a number of patients uh, who are affected by cervical cancer, and so <coughs> we should still uh, keep uh, the guard uh, up uh, uh, for treating those patients. But what do you think, Xavier? Yeah, of course. One thing is to have a vaccine, and the other thing is to vaccinate uh, 300 million girls in the world. That's not an easy task. I mean, we, we, are, we had the vaccine against polio in the 50s, and, and we are still having polio in the world. We haven't succeeded to eradicate it. So there's plenty of work to do, and during those years, the cases that are already infected today and <clears throat> will continue to develop. Yeah, I do agree, actually. And then last, uh, a kind of uh, more clinically oriented question, and you alluded to the fact that uh, 
some uh, of uh, the women who already have a CIN uh, may uh, take advantage uh, of uh, a vaccination. And uh, uh, what do you think? Should we select uh, those patients uh, who are already HPV positive uh, uh, in some way to vaccine those? Should we uh, mm. make it uh, let's say, uh, HPV typing and vaccinate on the women who do not have the HPV 16 and 18. What do you think? Well, there's a number of cl clinical questions here that are, at the present time, they don't have a clinical trial to, to, to be very positive on what the recommendation should be. But I'm sure that those vaccines will increase their, their scope of use. And... <clears throat> If you take it backwards and you think that a woman with a CIN2 or a CIN3 is a woman that has been incapable to handle HPV-16 infection, <clears throat> if she gets confronted with the same virus again, she might fail again to, get, to mount a good response. And therefore, uh, without, without the empirical evidence that is usually desired, many colleagues in the world are using HPV vaccination as part of the treatment of women with cervical lesions. And I'm sure that these indications will expand in the future. Yeah. <clears throat> a last question from the floor asks for a clarification of uh, what is meant by herd effect. And you alluded to the fact that uh, the effect of vaccination in uh, females uh, also have influence uh, on uh, HPV infection in males. Uh, can you uh, discuss a little bit uh, this very important issue. Yeah, there, there are a couple of slides coming along this, uh, uh, that discuss that in greater detail. But this is exactly what herd effect is, is that you have a certain level of protection against non-vaccinated individuals in the same community because you have managed to reduce the circulation of the virus and therefore the opportunities for infections are reduced. Okay, I think we can continue and uh, maybe discuss uh, some more uh, of these issues later. Go ahead. Okay, so if we go to slide number 29, this is an issue that has been uh, repeatedly in the press. It is in the minds of many women, mothers and girls and whoever. Is the vaccine safe? And uh, to make it brief, uh, what I can say is that We've examined the phase three trials and we've examined the post uh, introduction uh, uh, data and the majority, well, essentially all the review parties, including WHO, CDC, FIGO, the Gavi, UNICEF, all the national bodies continuously endorse the results and they indicate that there are not safety concerns. Slide number 30, for example, is an analysis of 35 million doses of uh, vaccines in the United States in 2011. Out of those, 0.1% reported side effects, 0.01% reported uh, severe uh, side effects. There were 68 cases of death, which are inevitably in any cohort that you examine and observe for a certain number of, uh, of years, and zero of those deaths were related to the vaccine once it, they were examined by a review party. Slide number 31 just gets from the, the same information from the trials, including over 40,000 women randomized 21,000 to vaccine and 22,000 to the placebo group. And you notice that the number of side effects, the number of side effects related to the injection side and the number of deaths are quite similar in the two arms. Perhaps the only one that outstanding is the difference in the local uh, side effects at the injection side that were more, more frequent in the vaccine group than in the placebo group. But all in all, the, the conclusion is that as far as today, there hasn't been any major side effect related causally to the vaccine that might trigger the suspicion that the vaccine may be harmful and should be stopped. So if we go to slide number 32, 
That's the beginning of the phase four studies. <clears throat> First for phase four studies, they relate to the observation of the impact of the vaccine in the population at large, outside the very tight and controlled observational rules of a phase three trials. And uh, the results are extremely important and eventually brings up the concept of herd immunity that we just discussed, which is that we observed that by vaccinating girls, we protect the girls that were not vaccinated in that population, <coughs> which is inevitably in every, in every vaccination campaigns, but we also had some impact on the infection of the males that were not vaccinated. So slide number 33 shows for a certain number of countries that have already reported on those results. You, said you have in the first line the coverage with the vaccination program ranging from 83 to 30% in Australia and in the United States. Those uh, observational studies, which include tens of thousands of individuals, they show a, a very significant decline in the occurrence of genital warts. This is a this is a, a series of studies using the quadrivalent vaccine, which includes HPV 6 and 11. And you can see that the reduction in genital warts in the female population ranges from 93% to 35%. 93% in Australia, corresponding to a coverage of 83% of the girls, 35% in the United States with a, a coverage of about 32%. But in the last line of this, uh, of this graph, of this table, you, you see that the herd protection for males, and that is beginning to be observed in Australia, in New Zealand, and even in the United States with a tiny coverage of vaccination of, of girls, Already we observe that boys in the same age group, they do have a reduction in the incidence of infections and disease. And this is shown in slide number 34, in which you have data from Australia, and this is the relative frequency of genital wards in a very large clinic, receiving about 53,000 new visits in the interval, of which 5,000 were traditionally genital wards. And the, the, the black line shows that girls that were received at that clinic after the initiation of the vaccination campaign, which is indicated by the red arrow, they essentially got rid of genital warts. This is an extraordinary impact in just five years since the beginning of the program, almost a reduction to zero of the occurrence of genital warts in a, in a an ecological study. So in those girls, there are still a few that were not vaccinated, right? And the yellow line shows what happened to the males of the same age, below the age of 21. You see that the reduction in genital warts in males started slightly after the reduction was observed in females, but also went as, as down as almost zero. <clears throat> and that is explained because the viral circulation in females is dramatically reduced and therefore uh, girl, uh, boys uh, were also reducing the amount of infection. So uh, the last part of my talk, which is slide 25, is where are we going and what are the expectations for the future? So if you, if you look at slide 36, that would be like a classical current model for cervical cancer prevention. In the majority of the developed countries, we are vaccinating girls 10 to 15. In some countries, we have a catch-up program expanding to up to the age of 26 in the, in the best of the world, that is the Australian. And then for the rest of the women, 25 to 85, we, we continue to offer uh, screening. If we screen with cytology, we have to do perhaps 10 to 15 event, screening events over a lifetime. If we move into HPV screening, the number of observations could be reduced to perhaps five or six. But that's the way things are being currently done in the most developed parts of the world. But slide 37 shows that things have changed dramatically. The majority of our indications 
uh, date from 2006 when the first vaccines were introduced. And at that time, we were just speaking about cervical cancer. Therefore, we focused on women and we focused on young women before sexual initiation. But at the time, the vaccine was extremely expensive and all the models that we built up and all the indications and recommendations were impacted by the fact that this was an extremely expensive vaccine. In those years, from 2006 to 2013, we've learned a lot. We've learned that there are many other cancers in both genders that are related to HPV. We've learned about the burden of genital warts in both genders. We've learned about the safety and the efficacy of the male vaccination, as well as the safety and efficacy of vaccinated and middle-aged women up to the age of 55. We've learned about herd immunity, and most importantly, we've learned about the extraordinary potency of HPV testing to reduce uh, the, the incidence of invasive cervical cancer by picking up the women at high risk with CIN2 or CIN3. At the same time, the price of the vaccine has significantly dropped. So slide 38 summarizes what could be the take home messages from that session. We now have HPV vaccines with the potential to prevent up to 90% of cervical cancer, and that happens worldwide. Greater than 90% of the rest of the cancers that are induced by HPV. And <clears throat> for the time being, screening, which we have not addressed uh, in detail in the presentation today, but HPV-based screening, because certainly in the vaccinated cohorts, that is the way that we have to move forward, will still be necessary for some time in vaccinated populations. And uh, current research and current interest begin to consider that we cannot continue to consider screening and secondary prevention on one hand, vaccination in another hand, we need both because both are extremely potent weapons against uh, cervical cancer. So slide 39 shows some of the things that we believe will occur in the years to come. <clears throat> Countries will slowly transition to HPV-based primary screening. This is happening in Italy uh, as one of the leading countries in Europe. We will see expansion of self-sampling. We will see simplified protocols of screening with uh, reducing dramatically the number of screening events, as well as simplified protocols of vaccination, perhaps moving into two doses rather than three doses. We will see the expansion of the age range of vaccination and moving from a restricted nine to 15 years as the target population to women at large in the screening ages. And we will see male vaccination. Slide number 40 tries to summarize the public health and logistic implications of the entire exercise. <clears throat> so far, the cervical cancer prevention field was restricted to the gynecologies, pathologies, screening programs, and screening technologies that form the basis of our ability to prevent cervical cancer for over 50 years. Then we received a different group of uh, professionals, those are pediatricians, general practitioners, vaccinologists, and clinical researchers that introduced the concept that cervical cancer could be prevented by vaccination. And finally, the major public health institutions which have to care for organizing centralized programs that are responsible for the majority of the communication and education exercises trying to finance and ensure equity in the preventive attitudes and they control the phase four studies. We are now moving into a model in which the three of them, they need to work together for uh, the best in the prevention of those diseases. And with slide number 41 from our first, our friend Botero from Colombia, I would like to thank you very much for caring about this project and being with us today here. The, the excellent lecture you gave.
and uh, for uh, what you did uh, for the study of HPV and uh, HPV vaccination implementation throughout the world and throughout uh, education and research. And uh, I think that uh, ASO on that uh, has also something to say, and I'm very happy to be part of ASO and uh, to be part of this uh, eager around uh, uh, community. Just one last final uh, uh, consideration. HPV vaccination is definitely uh, the uh, available vaccination, anti-cancer vaccination, which has the potential to eradicate a still very threatening disease, uh, which is cervical cancer and the other HPV-related cancers, which accounts for more than 300,000 uh, lives lost every year. So uh, research to implement uh, uh, this preventive uh, strategy are very important. Uh, Xavier, what do you think that should be number one priority? Uh, is it education? Is it uh, lowering uh, uh, the cost of vaccination? Is it uh, making public health policies more effective? Is it uh, vaccinating also males? Uh, what do you think as a, a concluding remark? Well, as a concluding remark, it's like prevention is, is like a clock. I mean, every component of the clock needs to work well to give you the hour. We need all of the ones that you mentioned. Certainly, the cost was a barrier at the very beginning. It is less of a barrier now. The Gavi countries have managed to get extremely low prices from uh, deals with the, with the industry that generates those vaccines. That might continue to happen. I think that it is important that the scientific community agrees on what are the best strategies to approach cervical cancer prevention, and then that the, the, the major public health instances like WHO uh, endorses those strategies, develops the tools to put them into place, and gets, gets off the ground a campaign like the ones that were done in the past with the smallpox or with the polio that were extremely successfully in eradicating an infectious disease and its consequences. Okay, thank you very much. I think that we can uh, close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.